Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. So today we welcome back Rebecca Voitsevich again to the podcast. She is going to speak about her new book, Life in the Vine, The Joyful Journey Continues. It is set to be available next month on January 6th. She speaks beautifully about this book. So I'm not going to give it too much of an introduction, except to say that I am really excited about this book and I can't wait to dive into it. I hope you enjoy. Rebecca, welcome back to the podcast. I am always so excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. (laughs) Rebecca, for anybody who might not have listened to our first episode together, which was all the way back last year in January, you were our first real episode that we had. So if anybody hasn't listened to that episode, would you give us a brief um, introduction to who you are and your work with Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Sure. Um, I was uh, someone who was found... Montessori method after college. Um, I had started graduate school for English literature, but I needed a job. And when I went out to a Montessori school and saw the way the children worked, the atmosphere, the peaceful atmosphere, how engaged they were, I knew right away that this was for me. So I had gone off to London for a year to, to do the primary training for Montessori and loved it. Uh, I came back to uh, my home in East Tennessee, that area, and began working as a Montessori directress. Um, but at the same time, I was searching for my adult place in the church. I had grown up in a very devout Methodist home, but as an adult, I had not found my place in in the church, the community. And so I started on a particular search that ended up bringing me to the Catholic faith. I joined. I don't say I converted because I didn't convert from anything, but I found a fullness for myself in the Catholic Mm -hmm. Church. And once I did, I began to pray very um, intently for a work that would bring together my love for Montessori and my desire to give glory to God, to be able to speak God's name, to be able to address the presence of God in their life with children. And at that mm-hmm. time, not even knowing that Maria Montessori had said that the fullest expression of her methodology would be seen in the area of religious development. Mm. That was kept quite a secret during those days in Montessori trainings. <clears throat> Nor did I know that Sophia Cavaletti <laughs> existed. So I was praying for something that I didn't have any assurance existed, but I ended up accidentally, it's a long story in itself, uh, seemingly accidentally meeting Sophia in a at a Montessori conference in Houston in 1978. And I just knew instantly this was the answer to my prayer. Mm. It took me a year, but I did uh, get to go to Rome and live there for two years. Uh, at that time, the catechesis formation course they did was levels one through three over two years. And it was a phenomenal experience in all ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, I came back. And I came to Washington, D.C. area to Christian Family Montessori School that was just starting uh, with that vision of having the atrium be the heartbeat of the school. And I ended Mm. up staying. I'm a terrible person when it comes to exact dates, but I think it was 15 or 16 years. I stayed there. Uh, and got to see the greatest part of that experience, I would say, was getting to see children begin at age three and go all the way through age 12. And I got to see mm. that unfolding. Um, and I treasure that of all my experiences in the catechesis. Um, but I came to Memphis in um, 25 years ago. And um, mm. I have been here ever since doing the catechesis in my parish, um, St. Patrick's, and also with the Missionaries of Charity. We have an atrium at their house on Saturdays, and then I do my parish work on Sundays. 
Um, but I've continued in this um, life of the atrium for uh, what forty, almost forty years now, um, <laughs> and I've had the good fortune of learning to translate Sophia's work, uh, to doing translations and 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 writing. Mm-hmm. So I've I've stayed in the world of the catechesis consistently, um, and it's a good place to be. <laughs> Yeah, I think because of your extensive time and experience with Sophia and Gianna, but also with the children in this work for so long, is um, why you have just this depth of knowledge. I feel like every time that I speak with you, I'm just kind of sitting at the feet of somebody who really understands what the child brings to us because um, of that extensive knowledge that you carry. And I'm I'm really grateful for you. Thank you. Well, you also are an author as well, and um, this is going to be a big year for you because um, another book of yours will be coming out. Yes. <laughs> Would you tell us a little bit more about that book, and how did this book come to be? Like, what brought this right. book about? This book came to be because Sophia's books that she wrote, The Religious Potential of the Child, when the first one came out relative to the three to six-year-old child, there was a bishop in uh, Canada, Bishop Marcel Gervais, and he had responsibility for catechesis, Catholic education throughout Canada. And he is one of those gifted adults who saw immediately that the catechesis of the Good Shepherd was he's a beacon of hope for the church. Hmm. And so hmm. he wanted a book that would make the riches of the religious potential even more accessible. He rightly recognized that the religious potential of the child is a powerhouse of Mm -hmm. theology, of poetry. It's such a beautiful testimony to the children through their comments and their artwork. Mm -hmm. But he also recognized that for the average layperson, it, it was a daunting book. Mm -hmm. Um, So he wanted a book that would somehow make it more accessible, both to parents and to potential catechists. Mm -hmm. He also had a vision that there would be an atrium in every area of Canada. He knew better than to Mm -hmm. mandate it. Uh, He knew Mm -hmm. it cannot be mandated, but he wanted it to be visible and present. And so the first uh, Joyful Journey, we tend to refer to it as that Patricia Coulter put together with Sophia and she had contributions from Jana and Silvana. That book came out in the late eighties. Don Bosco had published it. And then in the early nineties, LTP printed it, published it for wider Mm -hmm. distribution here. Well, when Sophia came out with religious potential two in 2002, we began to live the contents of that book and began to read and apply it and ponder it and so forth. And in 2007, at one of our concilio gatherings, I had a discussion with Sophia and she recognized that there would at some point need to be um, a similar joyful journey book relative to the religious potential about the older Mm -hmm. child. And I committed that I would do that, that I would love Mm. to do that. That was, Mm. what are we talking about, 13 years ago? Yeah. And so another beauty of this work is that we, we trust the timing of the Holy Spirit. And so although I committed to do that, and when I came back, LTP knew it was coming down the pipeline at some point. We're talking uh, over 10 years ago that LTP Mm -hmm. was waiting for it. And uh, wherever I would give trainings, I would, you know, people would say, is there going to be a joyful journey? Uh, Yes, I'm working on it. (laughs) But the truth is, it took me as long as it took me to know what is the right framework for such a book. We know Mm -hmm. it can't be a user's manual in the sense of say this, do this, next do that. You know, we Mm. knew that is not uh, conducive to the work of the catechesis. So I was praying, searching. I was always writing the book in my head. 
but I didn't have the right framework yet for it till about five years ago, we were planning for a, a level two formation leader uh, seminar in Atlanta. And in preparation for that, what had come to me then was a term that Sophia had used in our training. She also has a quote about it in RPC2, Religious Potential for the Older Child, about the spiral method. And so suddenly <laughs> that seemed particularly important to me to research mm -hmm. that, to rethink it. Uh, when I had been in Rome in the Rome course, and Sophia had spoken of it in the class, I had gone to her afterwards. I was intrigued by the term. I was not familiar with it. And I had gone to her and said, tell me more about the spiral method. And she said, oh, I think you will have to discover what it really means through your work mm -hmm. with children. Huh? She had that little <laughs> Mona Lisa smile on her face. You know? <laughs> okay. So after, uh, I guess at that point, it had been uh, 30 years I had been working with children. It suddenly mm -hmm. came its time to really focus on it. So in preparation for that level two formation leader course, I had developed um, and, and written about what the spiral method is and why it is so important to our catechesis. Um, and that launched me into that framework of the book. The spiral method is so particularly important because it is the way, Sophia said, our method must be co-natural with their contents. Right? And so it, our content is about the greatest mysteries of faith and the great mystery of the child and how they come together. Mm -hmm. In the early days when she was trying to distinguish the characteristics, uh, this was long before the 32 points, one of the early earliest, there were about eight or 10 points, one of them that she and Jana had identified was that we are about the de-schooling of catechesis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that de-schooling means is that we have to move away from that predetermined structure where we devise the content and we say, okay, every six-year-old is going to get this and every seven-year-old is going to get that and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we control mm -hmm. the content and we decide when a person learns what they need to learn. In the de-schooling, you need a different method. And so the method we use is to look at who is the child through the Montessori lens, to recognize those universal characteristics of that phase of development, right? Mm -hmm. And then how do we bring to that child that in that developmental period, how do we bring to them the richest content of faith? So with the spiral method, you have, there is no shortcut. You have to learn to know the child, recognize the child, and you have to know those greatest mysteries of faith and how they move from their most essential as the youngest children take us to all the way how it unfolds as they get older and mm -hmm. so it 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 has to form us it has to form us as adults because you can't just pick up a book and say okay child is nine i'm going to give this presentation that presentation if i hope that makes sense it says mm -hmm. okay if i know the theme and how it unfolds from most essential and how it expands, and I know the child, then I have the possibility of making that match that Montessori talked about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, meeting the child where they are, because this is, this is faith formation. It's not, it's not uh, CCD in the sense of just education or giving content. So mm -hmm. it was the spiral method that realizing that's my format for this book. 
and it was a great joy. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I could move forward. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it only took 13 years. That's all. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I'm so grateful that God inspired you with the spiral method. And now we are going to have this really beautiful book. And when you speak about the spiral method, Rebecca, um, I just want to clarify that you mean how like in level one, we hit these beautiful themes. And then in level two, we hit them again, but on a deeper level, following the child. And then again, in level three, like this, um, where we going around and around these Mm -hmm. themes, but on a bigger and a deeper level as the child is progressing in their spiritual growth and faith and age. And there's, you know, there's a bit of, I don't know, a puzzle or a trickiness about the language, because in one sense, as Sophia and John has said, the the youngest child teaches us leads us to what is deepest and Mm -hmm. so it it from one perspective it's not a matter that the older child goes deeper but they go wider and every time they expand Mm -hmm. they come back to that core that center in a steeper way but Mm -hmm. it's it's very important catechesis of the good shepherd. It's one of the most radically distinguishing characteristics is that we don't graduate with children from what is of lesser importance to what is most important as they grow, which is the normal, Mm -hmm. uh, I think conventional educational perspective, but instead with the youngest children, we look for the deepest, greatest mysteries. And we give it to them, but we give it to them in a very essential way. So part of our training, what part of our whole formation as catechist is to be able to answer that question. What is the greatest, most essential announcement, for Mm -hmm. instance, of the Annunciation? Mm -hmm. Because the Annunciation is packed full of riches. Mm -hmm. But with the younger child, we have to say, what do we draw attention to? What we draw attention to cannot be multitudinous riches. It has to be the richest aspects to it mm-hmm. that God chose that of all the women on earth, God made a choice. God chose a particular woman. This is powerful for of the, in the theology, God's choosing mm-hmm. Uh, so the spiral method is essentially to know what the fathers of the church called the vital nucleus of, of a theme of a religious reality. We have to know its vital nucleus. And then once we know that and can, can embrace that, then it will lead us into these expanded detail but we have to know the core we have to know Mm -hmm. the heartbeat of the theme and so the spiral method is is learning to honor that as led by the children the the middle-aged child what we call the in in italian it's mezzanelli the middle-aged the six to eight year olds if we follow them we see They've become very concerned with right, wrong, fair, unfair. And so they're going to lead us to a more moral perspective. Not that we determine that that's, it's time for that. For instance, with the precious pearl. Mm-hmm. For the very youngest child, what is the vital nucleus of that parable? And we believe it is first and foremost... The kingdom of God is something of greatest beauty and value. How many adults go straight to the moral response aspect of that parable and want to focus on what did he have to do to have Mm -hmm. that pearl? But the youngest child receives it as a gift. That's their great, Mm -hmm. great spiritual capacity. So if we're following the spiral method, we're not going to spend time with a three-year-old on, and what did he have to do? How do you think he felt about having to sell all those other pearls? 
no, no, that's not necessary. It's focusing on the beauty of that pearl. And young children know that they know what it means to focus on one thing, like my brother's sleeping with their metal fire truck they got for Christmas because it was mm -hmm. it was the mm -hmm. epitome of their desire. So it's the children who teach us this. Once we mm -hmm. find that vital nucleus, then it opens us up. It launches us, if you will, to go on discovering more and more about that theme as we grow, as we work on it. And this is true for a whole life. It doesn't end at level three. But the other reality in the spiral method is that we must constantly return to that most essential vital nucleus, heart of hearts, whatever one wants to call it. That's still what will propel us to keep going further. We never mm -hmm. abandon um, what is most powerful remains what is most powerful mm -hmm. for our life. So that's also why our focus is on adult formation as catechists, uh, but also for adults in the church that we have to, we all need to discover and be able to dwell in that which is most powerful, most beautiful. Um, and that is what will keep propelling us to those wider and wider realms of knowledge and detail and nuance and so forth. Mm -hmm. When we're anchored in that, that core essential. Yes. Anchored and constantly returning. Like Isaiah says, yeah. you know, in Isaiah 30, it, it is in returning and rest that you shall be saved in quiet and in trust shall be your strength. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what we need for the whole of our life. Mm-hmm. Well, man, Rebecca, level two and level three, those are big. <laughs> there, there's a lot there. And I imagine like we have one book for joyful of joyful journey for level one and level two and level three, they're really huge. So how were you yeah. able to use the spiral method and such a huge amount, I guess, exactly. is what I'm thinking of content that we, we do in level two and three. Uh, actually... Uh, several years ago, uh, we were at a catechist uh, gathering in Chicago, and I was on a walk with Patricia Coulter, who uh, who did the first Joyful Journey with Sophia and so forth, but it was really her. Uh, she led that project, and we were talking about um, Joyful Journey 2, and she said the same thing. I had asked myself the same thing. How is it possible <laughs> with so much content in level two mm -hmm. and in level three, how is it possible to do one book that would cover both? <laughs> this, the answer to that was for me in that what is needed in a book, no book can substitute for formation. Mm -hmm. This is not a user manual. If it were a user manual, it would be at least two more volumes. But this that's not the purpose of this book. When I came back to clarify what is most important, what is most needed, is that all of us who are working with the children in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, what we need most of all, I believe, in a book that we don't get so much information courses, which we know are absolutely essential. What do we get? We need help with seeing and understanding the big picture. It's a little mm -hmm. bit like the Fatucha, you know, or the Blue Strip in level two. They are the framework that will call forth those, especially by the time you get to level three in the plan of God, they're the launching pad for all the other detail. So I saw, yeah. I saw that this book needs to be offering a framework so that each adult who's a catechist for that to become part of them, that they, it would become more natural to 
receive a 10 year old into the atrium who had never been in the atrium and say, how shall I meet this 10 year old? He's not had level one, level two. Here he is. He's, he's 10 years old. How do I meet him? How do I, what do I offer him? And so it's knowing the most essential way that these themes unfold that most helps us to meet the child and know what to offer that child. Mm-hmm. And so in the end, level two and level three courses that take, what, um, 200 hours of Mm -hmm. training, right? And here Mm -hmm. I've written about it in, uh, let's see, there are those double column pages, just like Joyful Journey 1. I've written about it in 70, 80 pages. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Wow. And so obviously it's not a detailed how to present everything we Mm -hmm. do with older children. Chapter one is going to be returning to the youngest children. Uh, It's called the chapter one is called Wisdom in Early Childhood. Just as Sophia did in The Religious Potential 2, we're going to go back and remember that the greatest Mm -hmm. religious capacities and needs have already been manifest in level one. Mm -hmm. And yet there's that third greatest religious need and capacity that does not manifest itself until level two. And that's to explore and enjoy the mystery of time. But I go back to them, to the youngest ones for in the first chapter. The second chapter is called the spiral method to try to help people really understand what it is, how it works, and to feel more at home in it for our practices as catechists. Mm -hmm. And then chapter three is going to focus on who is that six to 12 child, obviously from a Montessori perspective, but also from the perspective of the catechesis of the Good Shepherd. What are their particular Mm -hmm religious leanings, needs, capacities? And then starting in chapter four, I'm going to look at each of these greatest themes and how it unfolds and not just from level two to level three (laughs) it has to start with level one Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. it's it's in each chapter so for instance chapter four is the the mystery of christ and that includes the covenant relationship the mystery of the incarnation the paschal mystery And in each of those subtitles, I'm going to show, try to show how, what is the most fundamental level of that mystery? And, and who has shown us that? The youngest Mm -hmm. children. So I'm going to go from youngest to middle age to the older child in trying to show what Sophia also called the bud to flower unfolding of that theme. Mm -hmm. Um, Chapter five will be the kingdom of God, um, but it's also it's the mystery of the kingdom. And then it's for older children, also the history of the kingdom. That's mm-hmm. the biggest chapter. <laughs> you can imagine it's going to yeah. cover. Yeah, that's the longest chapter. Um, chapter six is the Holy Bible. Uh, chapter seven is going to be, I have to remember myself. Um, <laughs> chapter seven is going to be moral life in the kingdom of God. And mm-hmm. we know there that. Uh, all of moral life is rooted in the gift and in the relationship that's established Mm -hmm. in level one. So even there, um, we're going to begin with thinking about how moral life has been, is founded in that um, first period of development, zero to six, Um, Mm -hmm. and then go on to the moral parables and maxims and so forth. Chapter eight is living the covenant. So this, we know one of the great themes of the catechesis is the unity of Bible and liturgy. And I have Mm -hmm. mentioned the liturgy in all those other chapters. But now in chapter eight, it will be looking more at specifically 
prayer and the sacraments and how they unfold um, from level one through level three. And finally, chapter nine is cosmic education, one of the great themes um, of our catechesis, um, which was, as we know, a Montessori term, but it's a way of saying, what is our real goal here? Mm -hmm. Um, And cosmic education is a term that brings that all back to what is it that we're really most trying to do? To orient, Mm -hmm. Sophia said, orientation to reality. And yet, Mm -hmm. what reality are we talking about? Um, We're talking about cosmic reality, God's reality. Um, And so that last chapter is on cosmic education. Um, Mm. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it was an exercise that like one of the main disciplines I learned in my catechist formation was what's most important is knowing what's essential and seeing the golden thread that runs through Mm -hmm. it. Right. So Mm -hmm. Sophia Cavaletti wrote in the old days, it was called the first name for what became the history of the kingdom of God from creation to parousia was first called um, Historia of Salvation. And then mm-hmm. when it was published in English, we called it History's Golden Thread. And the, the one about liturgy was called in English Living Liturgy. But in the mm-hmm. end, before she died, she went back to those books. She did not add to them. She took away, for the most part, she made it even more essential and she Mm -hmm. titled them so that they would, it would be more one one book in two volumes. So she Mm -hmm. changed the title, the history of the kingdom of God from creation to parousia and then liturgy and the building of the kingdom. But that is true to our work. We're not about always complicating things or adding and adding and adding, but more, Hmm. can we see what is most essential? And can we see the connective thread, the golden thread? Mm -hmm. And that was my aim with, with this particular book. Again, it will never substitute uh, for a formation course, but Mm -hmm. hopefully, hopefully it will help catechists to feel more at home in the in the patterns in the in what is essential and how it unfolds and hopefully Mm -hmm. hopefully it will help parents to be more in sync with their child's religious uh, unfolding and then always there's that hope that as Jesus told us, that we must turn and become like children. Um, We know in our characteristics that we are called to help to open the eyes of the church and other adults to to the riches of childhood. And hopefully uh, this book will be some inspiration to adults who may actually be wanting to understand what Jesus meant when he said, you must change and become like them. Mm. So, I'm really excited about this book, Rebecca. I love the way that it's very obvious that you did um, incorporate that golden thread from level one into through yeah. level two and through level three and how we've, we have these beautiful essentialities that have just kind of um, in, is present in all three levels. But then also right. it's obvious that um, you are lifting up the differences in that level two, level three child who's yes. in that Montessori plane, you know, like they're are able to move in time and space and they care about morality and they want to know what's right and what's wrong. Right. And right. In order for, I, I'm really excited to read this book so that I will be more clear on what is essential within each of those themes yes. because like I think a lot of people struggle with, I go towards what I am drawn towards as an adult. Right. Um, But like you're saying, what I heard you say earlier is that 
is that we have seen time and time again that the children are showing us that that is not what usually right. is not right. what is most essential. One of the uh, examples of that for me was in realizing in writing the book, it came, became more conscious to me that in level two, they speak in we terms. They, they speak, you know, so Montessori said they have almost this herd mentality, but they're so socially aware that they, they tend to speak in we's, you know, we should do this, we should do that, we don't like this, we want to do that, and so forth. <laughs> well, one of the subtle but very powerful things that happens for the, the second half of that second plane, the 9 to 12-year-olds, is it then turns to more what is my call, what, is, what are the gifts I have received, how do I want to contribute to this marvelous kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And when you're sensitive to that, when you're, you know, when you're open to that, you see that, that's what enables you to meet that child where they are. Uh, but it's all the, that awareness of, that, that's built up in us through Montessori understanding of the child, but also through the life of the atrium, that we become more and more at home with the, with the mystery of faith mm -hmm. and more at home with who the child in front of us really is because it's mm -hmm. always a problem. It's always not problem in a negative sense, but it's always the challenge of the match. Mm -hmm. Well, Rebecca, is there anything else about the book or this work that you would like to speak into before we finish today? I would want to remind people that the what I think of as the gospels of their work are already written. Um, they're the religious potential of the child one and two. They're Jonah's book on listening to God with children, where she talks about how the Montessori principles are, are uh, enfleshed in the atrium. Mm -hmm. We already have, if you will, the Gospels. Then we have what I, I don't want to sound <laughs> presumptuous, but I, as I've thought about this, Joyful Journey 1 and 2 are to me more like the letters, the epistles in terms of mm -hmm. this is how it, it's lived. This is relative mm -hmm. to the actual atrium life. This is breaking it down in a way that makes it more accessible. Then there's another category of, of writings that we have to always remember. Um, one would be these books that some catechists have written that are more testimonies to the children themselves. And as I point out mm -hmm. in the preface to this book, that's a deficit of this book. I give very few examples of the child and they're, that the child is who's led us. So, um, but other catechists have done this. I know Catherine Moresco wrote several years ago, Double Close, or Pam Moore did um, Taste and See. Uh, mm -hmm. And then Anne Del Sword in Australia has done In Our Heart of Hearts. There are those testimonies to children's responses, just as Sophia does in both religious potential books. But then there's also our uh, Catechism of Good Shepherd Association journals, and they are mm -hmm. rich in artwork, in children's prayers. I particularly love the uh, testimonies of what we called in, in, um, in Italian ex bambini, those children who grew up in the atrium and are giving testimony as adults um, to the role that Catechesis of the Good Shepherd has played in their lives. So there are, are many sources, there are many resources we have uh, for this ongoing um, understanding and appreciation of both what the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd really is and, and how it lives um, in the children's lives. Mm -hmm. So th in other words, this doesn't, <laughs> the purpose of this book is not to be the be all end all of what is catechesis uh, of the Good Shepherd, but it's meant to 
to ha it has its own purpose of helping us to be clearer about what is what are the most essential mysteries of faith how do they evolve how do they unfold as the children have shown us and mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm really grateful that you have spent the last 13 years thinking and praying about this book <laughs> and that it is finally ready for us to I be know. able to read. I am so grateful for your diligence and that you <laughs> stuck with it. <laughs> Maybe now I can I can go write a novel or poetry or who knows. A, no, it won't be a yeah. book, but anyway, it does. It is, <laughs> I do celebrate too just because it has been... Uh, in the forefront of my thinking for so long. So I'm, yeah. I'm glad to. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so excited to read this book in January when it comes out. Thank you for talking with us about it and for gifting us with this little present. My, my delight. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. In the show notes, you can find a link so that you can pre-order your copy of Life in the Vine, The Joyful Journey Continues. The book is set to come out on January 6th, so less than a month away. If you don't already own a copy of Religious Potential of the Child 2 for the 6 to 12 year old, you might want to order a copy of that along with your copy of Life in the Vine. Our CGS USA e-store has a lot of different Advent items that you might be interested in and a lot of items that you could use as gifts as well for your Christmas season. Remember that at the CGS USA e-store, your purchase has a purpose. We have also begun our annual appeal for CGS USA. Our goal is $100,000 by the end of 2020. So we ask you to please prayerfully consider financially joining CGS USA on our mission. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We want to thank all the contributing members of the association because you are making this podcast possible. If you want to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for joining us. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.